Our next uh, speaker is Dr. Danielle Wellman. And Dr. Wellman is currently completing a fellowship in women's imaging at Duke University Hospital, where she also completed her diagnostic radiology residency. She is a native of Houston, Texas. She attended Texas A&M as an undergraduate and the University of Texas in Houston for medical school. And no one knows for sure whether she roots for the Aggies or the Longhorns. Dr. Wellman is a newlywed and very fortunate for us at Wake Radiology. She will be joining our practice in the summer of 2010. Today she will be discussing the pros and cons of ultrasound and MRI and evaluation of the female pelvis. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Wellman. Good morning, my name is Danielle Wellman. Today we'll discuss um, radiologic evaluation of the female pelvis. Objectives of this are include um, we're going to review techniques of radiologic evaluation of the pelvis, including ultrasound, MRI, HSG, and touch on others. We're going to understand appropriate indications for ordering these studies based on different clinical scenarios. Here, an ultrasound consists of mechanical vibration of the particles or molecules of the material. Frequencies used in medical imaging are much higher than audible range, which is why they're called ultrasound. The degree of echogenicity uh, depends on tissue interfaces and the ability to transmit or reflect sound waves. The first line imaging modality for the female pelvis is widely available. It's has a broad acceptance as a familiar test. Everyone's had the <coughs> their fetal ultrasound images that are so proud of, like this one. Um, they're relatively inexpensive. It's portable, has a high, and the higher resolution of transvaginal ultrasound has led to a higher diagnostic ac accuracy for pelvic pathology evaluation. And here's just a laundry list of the different indications for ultrasound of the female pelvis. There are many. MRI is the use of powerful magnetic field, radio frequency pulses, and a computer to produce images of the body by using nuclear magnetic resonance of protons to produce proton density images. Here are just a few examples here, high resolution images. MRI is increasingly used to evaluate pelvic pathology due to high contrast resolution, multiplanar imaging capabilities, and absence of ionizing radiation and iodinated contrast material like you would have in CT. Here are just axial, sagittal, and coronal images through the MR, the pelvis. Shortcomings of MRI include time and positioning. Patient must lay flat for greater than 20 to 30 minutes. Expense, patient comfort, problems with claustrophobia and noise, metal incompatibility artifact. Here you can see a ICU bed. A lot of metal had a problem with the strong magnetic field. It's a very strong magnetic field, and you can have a lot of complications if you get um, metal close to that. Um, pacemaker incompatibility size limit, so there is a, you know, gantry. If you can't fit in the gantry, you can't get in the exam. And then gadolinium reactions, which have been more common in the press lately, the NSF or nephrogenic systemic fibrosis. And here's just a skin reaction from that. And then allergies are rare. Um, it's also not recommended in the first trimester of pregnancy. So MRI techniques. Basically, you just use a specific coil um, you can use glucagon to help decrease um, bowel movement artifact. Um, we do 3D imaging through the pelvis and T2 weighted images or water bright images and then we reformat into sagittal, coronal, and axial images. <coughs> you also want to do um, axial T1 images without fat, without fat saturation and then with fat saturation, axial and sagittal plane before and after contrast. Here's just a laundry list of the um, guidelines for performance of MRI of the female pelvis. So here we'll go over normal uterine anatomy. So here's a drawing on the left, sagittal midline cut through the pelvis. And here you can see on the MRI, this T2 weighted exam, which is best to outline the different um, layers of the uterus here. So here's a cut straight through the uterus here, cervix, vagina. And here you can see the bright T2 endometrium centrally. The low signal junctional zone surrounding that, and the intermediate myometrium <coughs> surrounding that. <coughs> and then here's another um, sagittal image. Here you can see the cervix is the base of the uterus. This is low signal. And here the cervix centrally, it's high signal. This is an axial image, so it's cut sliced straight, straight through. Here's a high signal mucus and glandular tissue centrally within the cervix. And then peripherally, you see the low signal extension of the junctional zone. And then the vagina is just this H-shaped structure here, which is collapsed uh, vaginal tissues below the cervix on the axial image. So on ultrasound, you have um, phases of the normal endometrial cycle. You have the early proliferative here. We have a very thin little endometrial stripe, that bright white line. 
This is the uterus here, longitudinal image. This is endometrial stripe. And then mid-cycle secretary, you start to see thickening here. This is a basalis layer here, outlining the different um, extent of the endometrial stripe here. And then late secretory, we see the thickest endometrial stripe. It's this whole dimension here. Um, on MRI, here you see a sagittal image through the ovaries. It's this soft tissue mass or soft tissue structure here. These high T2 follicles, the fluid follicles surrounding it. And here in an axial image, you see the oval um, ovary with the follicles surrounding it along the pelvic sidewall. And on ultrasound, different phases of ovarian cycle, you can see the follicular phase here, little follicles within the ovary. Then you start to see the dominant follicle by age or by day 10. Here's the dominant follicle. And then luteal phase, you start to see the corpus luteum cyst with thick walled cyst here. So I'm going to go over these clinical indications for radiologic evaluation of the female pelvis. Um, I'm going to start with pelvic pain, then abnormal uterine bleeding, pelvic mass evaluation, GYN malignancy staging, and infertility workup. If we have time, we'll just go quickly through some pregnancy um, complications. So first of all, pelvic pain. So differential for acute pelvic pain, we'll go over acute and chronic. So acute pelvic pain, usually you want to evaluate first with ultrasound. Differential diagnosis, these are the main things we're concerned about here, the top three. That's ectopic pregnancy. You always want to make, make sure in a premenopausal female you check the beta. Pelvic inflammatory disease and ovarian torsion. Cysts can also be a common um, reason for pelvic pain in premenopausal female. And then non-GYN etiology. So you can do an ultrasound or CT depending on your, what the clinical scenario is. So here's an example of a patient presents with pelvic pain and positive beta. You can see the longitudinal image of the uterus here. And there's fluid layering within the uterus, but no true gestational sac. Here you can see in the left adnexa, you see this thick-walled structure. And here, it's not showing up very well, but this is an ovary. And we can do compression um, or movement. This is actually transvaginal ultrasound. And see if that structure is separate from the ovary. See if it moves separately from the ovary, and this did. And on blood flow, significant blood flow around this. And this is actually an ectopic pregnancy. You always want to check for fluid in the pelvis or flanks to suggest that this might be ruptured. Pelvic inflammatory disease. So here's a picture of a pyosalpinx on the left. Here's a tubular structure. And you can see it's filled with this echogenic material, and that's uh, purulent material. And here's a tubular and abscess, this large, complicated adnexal mass. Part of this is probably tube and then an abscess adjacent to it. And then on, um, and these are actually hydrosalpings found incidentally. <clears throat> and here's on MRI, a sagittal, um, or coronal image through the pelvis. And here's this tubular structure, which is bright signal within it, which is fluid. That's hydrosalpinx on MR. And then this patient had right lower quadrant pain. And incidentally, well, actually this was the cause of the pain, was a PID with hydrosalpinx here in the right lower quadrant. And then here, an um, example of a patient who also presented with white, right lower quadrant pain. So they're worried about appendicitis. They got a CT first. And on the CT, they saw this low signal um, structure here, the cystic component. They didn't see an ovary um, in the normal position. This is a little high for an ovary. And this is the uterus with an exophytic fibroid here. So we recommended ultrasound um, based on the findings on the CT. The appendix looked normal. Here you can see the left ovary, normal blood flow here, and Doppler, and then the right ovary, it's large, hypoechoic, edematous, and there's no true blood flow. So this is right ovarian torsion. And so for chronic pelvic pain, if thought to secondary to GYN etiology, we usually recommend ultrasound first. You can detect things like endometriosis, adenomyosis, fibroids. <clears throat> um, other causes for chronic pelvic pain include dysmenorrhea, ovulation pain, and other non-GYN causes. So the radiologic evaluation um, should be based on the symptoms. So endometriosis, just to go over that really quickly, um, it's functional endometrial tissue in an extra uterine location, can cause cyclical pelvic pain and fertility, and it can have, you can have complications related to adhesions. <clears throat> endometrioma is just a focal 
um, collection of endometriosis within the ovary, and it'll have high T1, low T2 signal. And these are just two uh, examples of endometriosis and endometrioma here on axial T2 weighted MR images. <clears throat> so the second clinical indication I'll go through is abnormal uterine bleeding. So in a premenopausal female, the most common etiologies are structural uterine pathology or fibroids, polyps, adenomyosis. Usually when I try to evaluate those first with ultrasound if they're suspected. Um, if there's another um, etiology is pregnancy. So you always want to check beta-HCG in these patients with abnormal bleeding. If it's positive, recommend ultrasound, document intrauterine pregnancy. Um, anovulation, bleeding disorders like von Willebrand's disease, medication-related bleeding, and then um, neoplasm, <coughs> which you can also see first with ultrasound. Um, infection and trauma are much less likely. So um, to start off, fibroids or leomyomas, they're benign smooth, no, smooth muscle neoplasms. They can cause bleeding, pain, and infertility. Um, so they're common, 20 to 30 percent of women under, or greater than 30, and 40 percent of women over 40. There are three types. There's the subserosal, which is just under the outer lining of the um, uterus. There's intramural, which is the most common, which is just within the myometrium. And then submucosal is the least common, but it has the most symptoms, um, pain and bleeding. And here's an ultrasound. This is kind of dark, but showing um, hypocoke fibroids within the uterus and this irregular shadowing posteriorly from these. An ultrasound, usually it's type, typically hypoechoic. You have attenuation of sound by the fibrous tissue and the smooth muscles, smooth muscle cells, and it frequently distorts the external contour of the uterus and the endometrial stripe. And on MRI, <coughs> these will be a circumscribed mass. Here on an axial T2 image, you see this large low signal T2 mass. It'll be low signal on T1, but it will enhance. You can see a pseudocapsule, which is just compressed tissue from edema and compressed vessels, or edema in compressed vessels can have high T2 signal rim. And they can have areas of degeneration centrally, necrosis, and that'll be high signal in T2. Um, one of the treatments, it's um, becoming more popular, is uterine fibroid embolization for fibroids. And um, we usually do MRAs or MR angiography. This is a maximal intensity projection image from the MRAs. And this is to show blood flow to the uterus. Um, make sure, want to make sure there aren't uh, accessory feeders to those leomyomas, which we would miss with a, um, just routine embolization of that uterine artery. And we want to make sure you don't have accessory ovarian um, feeders that are branching off near the uterine artery, so you don't want to get the ovary, too. And here's just a picture of an embolization. Pre-embolization, there's this large blush from the vascular fibroid, and then after embolization, that's gone. <coughs> So uterine polyp is another reason for premenopausal uterine bleeding. And it's just, um, you'll see an interluminal pedunculated endometrial mass. And it'll, um, it's equal to endometrium on T1, and it will enhance just like normal uterine tissue. And it's low signal on T2, which is this sagittal T2 image. You can see this low signal mass extending into the endometrial canal. Adenomyosis is another cause of premenopausal uterine bleeding. Here you have, um, and it's a it's an extension of the endometrial glandular tissue, greater than the third the depth of the endometrium. This is all this abnormal tissue extending through in, into the uh, myometrium. Can present with pain and bleeding. MRI is usually an exam of choice for definitive characterization. And it's, you'll see these high T2 foci, um, which are the ectopic endometrial glands. <coughs> And then you have thickening of the junctional zone. The actual definition is thickening of the junctional zone of that low signal zone on T2, which is greater than 12 millimeters due to the smooth muscle hypertrophy. And then you have focal adenomyomas, which is just a cavity with a low signal hemocytorin ring, which is from repeated bleeding. Um, so adenomyosis, here are just other uh, examples of adenomyosis. Um, here's the thickened junctional zone, that low signal junctional zone with a little ectopic endometrial glands. Here's just a boggy enlarged uterus, which can suggest adenomyosis on ultrasound. Um, and then here's the, uh, this is actually HSG, and you can see contrast extra extravasating these little endometrial glands, which are within the myometrium. So pregnancy, another reason for premenopausal abnormal uterine bleeding. So if the patient has a positive beta, ultrasound is usually pre performed to confirm the IUP, 
um, differential diagnosis, IUP, um, abortion, ectopic pregnancy, and gestational trophoblastic disease. There's no IUP seen on ultrasound. Differential diagnosis that we usually give is early intrauterine pregnancy, lost intrauterine pregnancy, or ectopic pregnancy. You should see yolk sac. These are just guidelines that we use. If the beta is greater than 1,800, if they have twins, it can be, um, you have to be conservative because if they have twins, it can be greater than that. And mean sac diameter greater than 10. Um, beta levels can differ depending on hospital, depending on what standard they use. So we usually go by this mean sac diameter. If there's no evidence of IUP or ectopic on the ultrasound, then we, re we usually recommend close clinical laboratory follow up, follow those betas, and then follow up ultrasound in a week to see if there is an intrauterine pregnancy or an ectopic that's developed <coughs> or become more obvious. Um, so, postmenopausal bleeding differential includes endometrial carcinoma which is a cause of bleeding at about 10% of postmenopausal females. That ranges from 1% to 25% depending on the risk factors. You can have atrophy, the vaginal mucosa or endometrium, which is the most common cause. Um, in the early postmenopausal years, you can have endometrial hyperplasia, polyps, or submucosal fibroids also causing um, postmenopausal bleeding. Here's an example of endometrial thickening on MRI from endometrial hyperplasia. This is. Um, T2 weighted here. This is the endometrium thickening. So thigh size threshold for endometrium. Focal thickening seen on ultrasound is always abnormal or MRI. Um, greater than five millimeters in a postmenopausal female with bleeding or greater than eight millimeters if they're on unopposed um, hormone replacement therapy. Um, if the endometrium is less than five millimeters and they're bleeding, it's usually, we usually diagnose with atrophy. Endometrial atrophy is a cause. Um, there's no upper threshold for endometrial size in uh, premenopausal patients, and no known threshold for asymptomatic postmenopausal women. Some use greater than five, others use greater than eight. So, like I said, focal endometrial, endometrial thickening is always abnormal. You think of polyps, fibroids, endometrial carcinomas, blood clots. If focal thickening is seen on ultrasound, we usually recommend sono or saline infused sonohistography or SIS for further evaluation. And what SIS is, is where you cannulate the cervix, infuse sterile saline, and then repeat that ultrasound. So you can really see the definition of the endometrium, endometrial canal very well. Um, and this will help define focal abnormalities um, and indications are abnormal persistent uterine bleeding and also evaluate thickened endometrium. So here's an example of a submucosal fibroid. Here you can see <coughs> the distended endometrial canal here with saline in it. There are a few air bubbles here. But then this broad-based um, mass, which is extending into the endometrial canal, and it's got posterior, this uh, characteristic posterior acoustic shadowing. It's important to def define how much of this mass is within the endometrial canal, because you can do hysteroscopic myomectomy if greater than half the volume is actually within the endometrial cavity. Polyp, here's um, it's another reason for or premenopausal bleeding. Here you have... Uh, or focal endometrial thickening. Here's the endometrial canal here, filled with saline, and these polypoid structures extending into the endometrial canal. And here's this narrow stalk homogeneous polyp extending into the endometrial canal. So for diffuse endometrial thickening, differential includes hematometrial colpos, which is actually fluid distending the endometrial canal. Endometritis, which you see more in like post or postpartum women. <coughs> Tamoxifen therapy, endometrial hyperplasia, which is most common in the paramenopausal females, and endometrial carcinoma. So clinical history is very important in the workup of these patients. Hematometrial colpos, here you can see some examples of that on ultrasound. It's layering blood and secretions within the uterus and the vaginal cavity. If it were just within the uter uterus, it'd be hematometros. <clears throat> in adolescent females, this is usually secondary to imperforate hymen. In older females, either, either hematometrios or hematometrocopos, you think of adhesions or cancers causing this distension and blockage of the cervical canal or the vaginal um, canal. So diffuse endometrial thickening is also caused by tamoxifen therapy. You can see longitudinal image of the uterus here. And this diffuse kind of cystic appearance of the endometrial canal here, all these little cystic low signal or hypoechoic areas. And here's a cross-sectional or transverse image through the uterus. And here you can see the cystic cavities within this patient, which has a large endometrial stripe. 
And so another indication for radiologic evaluation of the female pelvis would be pelvic mass evaluation. You want to determine if these masses are ovarian or extra ovarian origin. You need to recognize classically benign um, lesions and understand the workup of ovarian lesions. So extra ovarian masses, a differential includes leiomyomas. These can be pedunculated or broad ligament. I've also seen free-floating leiomyomas within the pelvis that have broken off, probably necrosis or blood supply. <coughs> um, Hydrosalpinx, perineal inclusion cyst and paraovarian cyst, and then other non-GYN lesions. And here's a low signal uh, leiomyoma right here, which is in the broad ligament. And here's a uterus here with another sub mucosal fibroid here. This is a coronal T2 weighted image. So um, other extra ovarian lesions, hydrosalpinx, and you see this anechoic tubular enfolding shape of these uh, hydrosalpinx on MRI. This is a sagittal MRI through the pelvis. You saw some other examples earlier of those. And then peritoneal inclusion cysts are these fluid collections with geometric margins within the pelvis can be postoperative but this fluid collection, this fluid collection, and here, and then here's an example of one on MRI, a sagittal image of the pelvis. And this is the bladder anteriorly, this patient a hysterectomy, this is the vagina, and this is an abnormal fluid collection here. And that's a uh, perineal inclusion cyst. So another um, extra ovarian lesion would be a paraovarian cyst. And this is a Wolfian duct remnant. You can have simple cysts, which are large and round, and can be difficult to differentiate from a large ovarian cyst. Here's the cyst, 5.5 centimeters. Here's the ovary squished next to it on an axial T2 weighted image. And then here's the ovary on ultrasound and the cyst on transvaginal ultrasound. And then for ovarian lesions, it's important to <coughs> differentiate classically benign lesions like functional or physiologic cysts, hemorrhagic cysts, dermoids, endometriomas from things that are indeterminate or suggestive malignancy that they need to work up further. So here's an example of a follicular cyst or a physiologic cyst. It's just this unilocular anechoic structure here. This is magnified. Smooth borders, thin septations, which is you start to see here. These generally resolve in one to two weeks. And then here's an example, another example, an ultrasound with just two larger follicles in the ovary. Corpus luteum cyst, you saw an example earlier. Thick-walled cystic structure in the ovary. These also have a lot of blood flow, and they usually regress by day 14 of the menstrual cycle. Hemorrhagic cysts, usually corpus luteal in origin. They'll have mobile echoes within it, and they'll have this trabeculated reticular pattern, the geometric mobile, um, and a mobile solid component. Here you can see layering fluid here. And then mature uh, teratomas, or dermoids, <coughs> another benign ovarian mass. You can see tip of iceberg sign. You see echogenic dermoid plug with posterior shadowing. You can have fat fluid levels within these dermoids, um, mixed solid cystic structures. And you see this dot dash appearance in this cyst, and that's actually hair floating within the dermoid. Treatment is usually removal. They have a low malignant potential, squamous cell carcinoma. And there is a risk of torsion or rupture. I've seen quite a few cases of uh, torsion from these. Um, so another benign or dermoid here just on MRI, you see axial T2, T1 weight image. You see, you see the subcutaneous fat. These are non-fat saturated images. There's high signal anteriorly within this large pelvic mass. And then that area saturates out on the fat saturated image. So that's actually fat within this large mixed um, tissue dermoid here. So that's benign. And then here's another example of fat within this large mass, saturates out, it's just a dermoid. Endometrioma is another benign ovarian mass. Um, it's a topic growth of endometrial tissue like we discussed before. Thick brown fluid, chocolate cyst is what they've been described as surgically. Um, they're often adherent to surrounding structures. You can see these homogeneous low-level echoes and septations possible, but you shouldn't see flow, blood flow within there. And here's just more examples of endometrioma. <coughs> Dark signal on T2 from the viscosity protein and hemoglobin. Um, they can't have a hemocytic ring and septations from repeated bleeding, which is just this low signal ring around it. <coughs> 
Okay, so ovarian masses, ultrasound predictors of malignancy, solid components, nodular papillary, thick septations greater than two to three millimeters, flow within the solid areas of septations, and then free fluid. <clears throat> I put these diagrams in your handouts. These are just how we go through a workup of um, ovarian masses. Premenopausal female. Um, our cutoff has been in the past 2.5 centimeters. There's a recent um, conference this last weekend, Society of uh, Radiologists and Ultrasound. They discussed um, maybe moving this up to five centimeters. Nothing's been written about this, but that may be in the future. <clears throat> so benign cyst, what we do now is 2.5. We usually recommend follow-up in two to six weeks because with the, men or the patient's periods, they'll change in that time. They should see a change in these. <clears throat> and then um, if you see a complex or, complex or solid mass and you think it might be a hemorrhagic cyst, we usually recommend follow-up in six weeks. If there's um, <clears throat> flow in the solid areas or septations, we recommend GYN consult. And then um, if on follow-up we are not sure, or if we're not sure it's hemorrhagic cyst, we still go to GYN consult. And then a postmenopausal female is obviously more concerned about malignancy in these patients. So we have very conservative cutoff of a centimeter at Duke for ultrasound. If we see a simple cyst greater than a centimeter in postmenopausal females, we usually recommend GYN consult or MRI for their evaluation. <clears throat> and um, if it's less than a centimeter, we usually recommend many months follow-up. And that's because these women aren't going through the um, menstrual cycle. They won't their cysts won't change as fast as um, women, premenopausal females. These lesions are obviously more suspicious if they have ascites, elevated CA125, or if they change in size or morphology in the follow-up. RI and PI, resistive indices and pulsatility indices, they're just ultrasound measurements which show that there's decreased resistance to blood flow. So this is a vascular tumor. So that's also been described as causing a high risk. Um, complex or solid mass usually go right to GYN consult. More concerning for malignancy. Very concerning. <clears throat> so we'll just go through real quickly the GYN malignancy staging. Um, so staging of an ovarian, endometrial, and cervical cancer I'll discuss quickly. Ultrasound, first line evaluation of adnexal masses and dysfunctional uterine bleeding, where usually they'll start <clears throat> the workup of these malignancies. MRI can show the extent of disease and do the local staging of gynecologic tumors. CT can detect extra pelvic disease. And PET CT can be used to detect distant metastatic, metastatic disease and to find appropriate surgical candidates. So cervical cancer is usually a diagnosis of premenopausal females. <clears throat> Most combined to the cervical canal at diagnosis, diagnosed by pap smear more commonly now. They present with bleeding discharge and um, the spread is usually by local extension into the adjacent pelvic or organs and lymph nodes. Here you can see a sagittal image midline through the pelvis, T2 weighted. Here's the uterus. And the cervix, rising from the cervix is this hypo um, or low, like intermediate signal mass. It's lobulated and it's involving the bladder here, the posterior wall of the bladder, and likely involving parts of the rectum here posteriorly. Um, so, like I said before, mostly diagnosed with pap smear. MR is an Im imaging study of choice and local staging because we can define the parametrium, which is the out, out, like outer contours of the cervix, basically, that defines <clears throat> if there's local extension outside of this. Um, if there's invasion of the parametrium, then we call it stage 2B, and um, this identifies patients who may not be candidates for surgery. So if they're less than 2B, they are candidates for surgery. And then CMS is now proposing to cover a single PET CT for staging, but not for diagnosis. So this is just showing the stages of cervical cancer. XRT and surgery, if it's 2A or above, and it's beyond the parametrium, radiation treatment only is recommended. So next, endometrial cancer. It's the most common GYN malignancy. It's usually diagnosed in postmenopausal females. Peak is 55 to 65 years old. Presentation is usually dysfunctional uterine bleeding. The risk factors are unopposed estrogen, or reasons for unopposed estrogen. Surgical staging with nodal sampling is usually performed for these patients. Here on imaging, <clears throat> like I said before, our ultrasound, widening of the endometrial stripe greater than five in these uh, postmenopausal females with, uh, with bleeding. <clears throat> and then on MRI, the tumor 
usually is increased in t or high T2 with respect to myometrium. This is actually T1 post contrast. You see this enhancing mass extending into the endometrial canal, and it's starting to disrupt the um, junctional zone there. <coughs> so, ovarian cancer, peak incidence of at 45 to 55 years old, um, risk factors, family history, nulliparity, late menopause, late childbearing. This usually presents later, so there's decreased survival. Um, you can present with swelling, ascites, low-grade um, abdominal pain. And then staging here is listed in your syllabus. CT is currently recommended for staging. You can see in the ovary, predominantly cystic mass with nodular enhancing wall and septa. You can also have ascites, hydronephrosis, a mental disease. Here you can see an example of a mental caking here with carcinomatosis related to ovarian cancer. All this enhancing soft tissue here is just a mental disease, um, metastases. And then lymphadenopathy is less common in ovarian, or ovarian cancer. There's significant overlap in the imaging um, appearance with MRI. Here's just an example of ovarian cystic mass with an enhancing mural nodule here. I don't know if you can see that, but that's ovarian cancer. And here's just a diagram of the large ovarian cancer with solid and cystic components. Soft signs of malignancy, cross-sectional imaging are very similar to the ultrasound. Um, thick citations, irregular walls. Here's papillary projections into the cystic mass arising from the ovary. And you can have a large soft tissue component with necrosis. And then bilaterality is also a softer sign of actually malignancy in these masses. So infertility workup, I'll just go over really quickly. Um, approximately 12% of females reproductive age reported to be infertile in, this, in the United States now. So it's becoming more and more common. Um, so we're doing more and more of these workups. Pelvic causes of female infertility include tubal and peritubal abnormalities, then uterine, cervical, and ovarian disorders. So I'll go over a few of these. So we usually start with HSG or hysterosalpingogram in these patients because <clears throat> we want to evaluate for fallopian tube patency. So here you can see HSG is performed similar to the SIS where you cannulate the cervix but you in infuse contrast. Then you take um, images while the uterus is filling. <clears throat> you can see if there are any filling contours in the uterus and then you can actually see if there's spillage of contrast out of the fallopian tubes, which you should see. And here's an example of salpingitis ismica nodosum, big word, just means that there are these irregular diverticular outpouchings, contrast from this fallopian tube. You don't ever get free spillage. And this is, they, they think, related to pelvic inflammatory disease, and it can be a cause of infertility. Here on the right is an example of a DES uterus, so a, a patient whose mother took DES. Here you can see a very abnormal appearing uterus here. It's T-shaped, <clears throat> and that's characteristic shape for the DES uterus. So, like I said, SIS, SIS can differentiate uterine synechiae, polyps, or submucosal lay myomas that may be causing infertility. Ultrasound and MRI can be used to differentiate lay myomas, adenomyosis, and malarian duct anomalies, which we'll go over in a minute. And then MRI is the most sensitive modality for detecting endometriosis, which can be cause of an, um, infertility in some of these patients. So here's an example of uterine synechiae, which are just adhesions within the uterus. They can cause a complete obliteration of cavity, of the uterine cavity, and here you see these little filling defects. This is the uterine outline here. These are the tubes, but all these little filling defects are just scarring in the uterus. It's called Asherman syndrome. It can cause menstrual abnormalities, infertility, spontaneous abortions. And so malarian ducts, um, and these paired structures that fuse between 6 and 11 weeks of gestation, caudal or cranial direction, they start to fuse. And they form the uterus, uh, the cervix, the fallopian tubes, and the upper two-thirds of the vagina. And the malaria duct anomalies are important to characterize because um, treatment options and outcomes vary between the different classes. <clears throat> malaria duct anomalies are caused of multiple first trimester abortions. They can be associated with renal anomalies um, because of paramezo nephric ducts and the mesonephric ducts are associated. And then the failure development can be partial or complete, unilateral and bilateral. Here's an example of a chart just describing different, um, from fertility and sterility, just showing the different types of developmental anomalies of the um, uterus. Here's hypoplasia agenesis, septa uterus, we just have the failure of resorption of the septum. Here you have unicornar uterus, where you only have the one 
one horn of the uterus that develops. Didelphus, where you have two separate horns, bicornuate, DES drug-related, and then arcuate at the bottom is just basically this contra abnormality, but no real um, effects from it. So unicornuate uterus on HSG up here, you can see the cannulation of the cervix, one horn of the uterus. You have a lateral flexed uterine horn on MRI. This is an axial image through the pelvis on MRI. Just that this one horn of the uterus is seen. You also want to look for rudimentary horn because this can cause <coughs> cyclical pain um, if, there's, if it's separate and there's no connection to the cervical cavity. It can cause cyclical pain because you might have endometrial tissue causing <coughs> backup of blood in that rudimentary horn. Malaria and duct anomalies, um, another type is uterine didelphus. You can see two separate um, cervices cannulated for this HSG. And here are the two different uterine horns. And here on MRI, axial and coronal, you see these two separate cervices and uterus, or uterine horns here. And here's just a coronal view showing the same thing. Bicorneate uterus, bicorneate uterus is just partial failure of the duct fusion, so you actually <clears throat> we'll have two uterine cavities. Um, you usually have a single cervix and vagina, but you can't have um, two cervices. And the treatment for this is open metroplasty, so it's open surgery for these, which is different from the septate uterus, where it's, it can look similar. You have a flat external contour of the fundus of the uterus, so, and these, they can just go in and hysteroscopic, hysteroscopically treat these with metroplasty. So I'll go over pregnancy complications quickly. Um, so, ultrasound is very common pregnancy. First trimester, a lot of women get conf uh, first trimester ultrasound to confirm and date their IUPs and determine fetal number and placentation and evaluate any um, abnormal presentation like bleeding like we discussed before. Second trimester, women get anatomy scans. And if fetal abnormalities are seen on these, they often are followed by repeat ultrasounds. And if the abnormalities are severe enough, um, MRI can be considered for fetal um, evaluation for, um, and consideration for intervention. Um, at some of the higher institutions like um, CHOP and Boston Children's, they'll actually go in and do surgeries on these patients that they have large thoracic masses that are um, obstructing you know, flow and you know, there's no chance for that fetus to survive. And then nuchal translucency is done. It's um, done more commonly now. You just Evaluate the nuchal, cord, nuchal thickness. It should be less than uh, six between 11 to 14 weeks gestational age. And that can be helpful to determining um, chromosomal abnormalities. So we already went over the bleeding differential diagnosis for premenopausal females. Um, here's another possible etiology for actual patient with an IUP. You can have subchorionic hemorrhage. You can see this hemorrhagic cavity adjacent to the gestational sac. And... Um, some of these I already went through. Um, here's another guideline. Gestational sac should be seen on transvaginal ultrasound, beta greater than 1,000. And fetal cardiac activity should be seen with a crown, lump, crown rump length of 5 millimeters. And fetal pole should be seen um, with a mean sac diameter of 16 millimeters. These are just two different um, abnormalities you can have with uh, placentation. Placenta previa, you want to evaluate first with ultrasound. Obviously, you're doing the ultrasound to evaluate the fetus. First, um, incidence increases with age, um, multiparity, and multiple C-sections. And that's when the placenta is just low-lying, covering the os or nearby the os. Um, you can also have just vessels crossing the os, and that's called um, base of previa. And the complications involved with this are third trimester bleeding, premature delivery, and perinatal death. And these are just the types, low-lying, marginal, partial, or complete, where it's completely covering the os. Placental invasion is another topic. It's separate from placenta previa. And it's actually just when the placenta actually invades into the um, myometrium. And it can do um, partial, like accreta and increta, actually percreta is through the serosa, and it can actually invade into the bladder. Um, and we'll do MR imaging with Valsalva, um, a cine image, so we can see if the actual bladder will move separately from the uterus on imaging to see if there's actually fixation of bladder against the uterus, which is important before the patients go in for a C-section to differentiate. MRI is also done for evaluation of acute abdominal pain in the pregnant female. Um, you know, we worry about acute appendicitis, thrombosis, gonadal vein, and ovarian torsion causing pain in these patients. Um, 
And this helps spare the risk for surgical intervention and ionizing radiation like in CT to the fetus and the mother. This is a MRI done recently. There actually was an abnormality found, but here's the, the fetus, the fetal head, it's upside down, it's in the right position. And there wasn't anything wrong with that one, so it was good. And um, so in summary, if a, patient, if a patient, female patient comes in with acute pelvic pain or dysfunctional uterine bleeding, you usually want to start with ultrasound. If there's workup for infertility, you usually start with HSG to evaluate um, tubal patency in the uterine contours, and often if an abnormality is seen, go to MRI ultrasound, depending on what, what is suspected. And it's important to avoid radiation exposure and contrast administration to pregnant females. So recommend ultrasound first, but MRI without contrast, because um, you can't give gadolinium to pregnant females. If, and that can be performed if um, you know, clinical exam and ultrasound is inconclusive. And then the radiologist is always there to help if you're clinic, with your clinical dilemma. If you're not sure what you need to order for the patient, just call us and we'll help you figure it out. It's good for us to know the history if it's complicated too. So I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Conte and Jaffe at Duke for their assistance and some of their pictures. Here's some of my references. Any questions? For ultrasound? Usually we always do, um, unless the patient um, hasn't had their period yet. Intact hymen, we usually always do abdominal and pelvic, or transabdominal and transvaginal ultrasound for anything with pelvic complaints. So any time a pelvic ultrasound is ordered, we do both. Anything else? I actually have a question. Yeah. Um, the patient comes in with bleeding and ultrasound is ordered and you suspected endometrial mass. Do you start with the sonal hist histogram or MRI or does it matter? So the patient has thicken like focal thickening on ultrasound? Do you suspect something's going on in the endometrium? Um, so the patient comes in with abnormal bleeding, you suspect something's wrong with the endometrium on ultrasound. Um, which route do you go? It depends actually on which radiologist is reading it often. If there's a high concern for malignancy, we'll often do MRI. Um, if you're really not sure, and it's not very malignant appearing, if it could just be a polyp or something we're suspecting, then we usually do recommend SIS. Yeah. Is there a limit as to the size of the cyst, leomyoma, whatever might involved in the location, I guess? That's a very broad topic to discuss. But yeah, it, if the leomyoma is lar too large and pedunculated, or there's too much of it within the endometrial canal, often they won't do those. Um, but I mean, the size, with it, if it's actually within the myometrium, I, I haven't really seen a limit for um, where they won't do those. They'll do very large lesions. But they'll be less amenable to um, treatment, or they the success won't be as it uh, won't be as success, successful if they actually are necrotic centrally and they don't have as much blood flow. Um, so that's that's another thing you think about. But they can do very very large fibroid embolizations. I've seen some very large ones before. And does the mass does that have to be extracted after you know whenever the cyst totally dies? So the mass like the the poly, the Leomyoma, does that have to be surgically removed? No, a lot of them will. We do follow-up MRIs for those, and usually they'll get smaller, and you'll see less enhancement on the post-contrast images. That shows uh, that it has been treated. Um, if symptomatically the patient's still having symptoms, and it looks like maybe some of the fibroids weren't treated, sometimes they'll go in and do myomectomies for symptomatic treatment. If um, Sometimes if there's too much of the fibroid within the endometrial canal, they'll, they'll actually necrose off their blood supply and actually go into the endometrial canal. That's why we don't do as many of those. We don't recommend those as much because then they'll have this dead thing within their uterine cavity and that can be cause of infection and get infected and then they would have to remove that. But, mm -hmm. yes? Yes. 
believe some of the BRCA patients do get yearly transvaginal ultrasound. I'll have to go back and review that, but um, I believe some of the BRCA patients. Have you seen that? Yeah, until they until they actually go in and remove them, they do screen um, screen them. Anything else? Is hmm? you evaluating a patient for uh, abnormal uh, vaginal bleeding and you do an endometrial biopsy? Mm -hmm. that So you just done a general, the patient had endometrial thickening and diffuse endometrial thickening. You did a, a biopsy. Um, usually, I mean, you can have air and hemorrhage in that area after biopsy, but um, that should resolve within a few weeks, a week or two, I would think. I haven't had that specifically come up as a problem on an ultrasound before. Anything else? Any risks uh, the fetus MRI? So like I said, they're not sure about the actual effects on the fetus. Um, first trimester, they just usually don't recommend it. Um, second and third trimester, there aren't any known bad effects. I'm in the MRI all the time, unfortunately, doing research and stuff. But um, gadolinium, obviously, there is the biggest concern with MRIs. But um, second and third trimester women, if you know, if the risks outweigh or the benefits outweigh the risks, obviously, so we usually will um, recommend MRI in those patients. Anything else? Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.